Thank you. And thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk about persuasive design, about how we can reduce friction using psychology, and how we can motivate users to take actions that they wouldn't have taken uh, if we wouldn't have done that. So the starting point of this presentation is that you have a great idea, and you probably have a great, great product, or a good one at least. Um, but for some reason, it doesn't really take off. Well, actually, I just found out that I started the wrong presentation. So I'm just going to switch. I'm so sorry for this. <laughs> just give me two seconds. Man. All right, all right, all right, I'm back. So sorry. All right, so the starting point is that you have a great product. Um, and for some reason, it doesn't really take off. Why is that? One thing could be that there are so many products out there that does pretty much the same thing. So ideas are plentiful, but execution isn't. So using psychology and using persuasive design to better your interface and to better the user experience can give you that leverage. Um, so why is it that some services take off while others don't? Just look at Friendster, MySpace, then came along Facebook and took the prize. Why did that happen? So you probably did your usability deeds. You probably have, you might see that you have high bounce rate. You have uh, few conversions. Um, Maybe users abandon your, your onboarding flow a little bit too early, or they don't return. Maybe you don't, you're not seeing the metrics that you'd like to see. And that might just be the problem, that you're focusing, focusing on metrics, because ulti ultimately, persuasive design and seduction, which it really is, is not about metrics. It's about love. Right? So. If your product was a girl or a boy that you were dating, how would your friends describe that product? They might say, um, let's see here, click. Okay, the, the joke was kind of ruined there. She's got great personality, whoa. She's got great personality, we all know what that means. That means, um, She's pretty boring, or at least she's not seducing. It's kind of like if a product said, well, you know what, I'm, a I'm actually a really good product, I've got good intentions, I can actually help you do something, but you have to really know me. And persuasive design can, can, can close that gap, can help people learn about your product, because we can help users take the actions that, that they need to do in order to explore all that your product has to offer. So, Persuasion is kind of like a relationship, and you need to, need it to, to, to treat uh, uh, the relationship um, the way you would treat your, your girlfriend or boyfriend, okay? So, so there are multiple steps and multiple stages. So first you have the, the sign-up problem uh, being seduced. So users uh, kind of know what your product is doing, but they're not motivated to, to start doing it, to, to, to sign up. Then you have the falling in love. That kind of translates into uh, the first time use uh, problem. So they signed up, but they don't know what to do or how to get started. And finally, it's about staying in love. That's the ongoing engagement problem. Click. All right. Maybe I should have used their clicker. All right. So we're going to go through each phase of these and, 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 and see I'm going to try to explain what kind of tools do you need to use uh, in, in according to what phase you're actually in, because you need to vary uh, your, your approach to how you, you uh, talk to users, how you design the experience according to where they are in the relationship. So start out by, by being seduced. How many of you have gone to a site like Groupon or downtown.dk uh, and bought something that you pretty much didn't need? Hands up, come on. Okay, you won't admit it, fair enough. I can admit it. I bought something and I didn't need it. So why did I do that? What made this experience work? Because, I mean, it's pretty simple. Well, if you look at it, uh, there's this uh, 
principle called scarcity in effect. So there's a limited time only offer. Uh, I need to act within 18 hours, and there's only six left. So that pushes me. It creates a sense of urgency. Uh, since this resource is scarce, uh, I feel that it has higher value, and I need to act now. Okay? So that's just one example. So what made this work? It wasn't usability. It wasn't graphic design. Uh, so where we see that usability is about evening out the bumps in the roads. That's how we normally approach making user experiences better. Uh, then we're reducing friction. I propose that there is something else that we should also consider. So if we think of, of friction as a vector, as something holding us back, and we can make that smaller and people will uh, reach their goal faster, then we can also think of something going forward. And it's called motivation. And for that, our toolbox is not usability, making things easier to use. It's about increasing motivation using psychology. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. So this journey started uh, years back. Now, I'm, I, I'm talking about a, a subject at a tech conference, uh, but I, uh, I come from a developer background myself. Oh. And I worked at... Uh, uh, had a great job in, in Copenhagen and that allowed me to work remotely and uh, I live with my brother who lives in, in California. He has this chain of nice cream, uh, ice cream stores. Uh, it's a great place to work. I got kind of bulky, uh, but it was great. Um, and I sat there for a month just working every day and I uh, got a chance to watch the tip jar. And I noticed that if, if no coins were in it in the beginning of the day, the, at the end of the day, there would be one, two dollars. Uh, but if we put something in, or if a, a tipper at the start of the day would put a five dollar bill in, then people would tip five dollars or more. Uh, if they put one or two dollars in, then people would kind of adjust and just put one dollar bill in. So we, um, we went out one night uh, at a bar and asked the, uh, the, the, the bartender um, about this and says, do you have similar experiences? I said, yeah, sure. We call that tipping the jar. There's a concept. They actually do that. They put money in there. So at bars, people even tip more. So if they put $20 bills in, people will actually tip $10 or $20 or something in the vicinity of that. Now, that's interesting. So why do we do that? So I turned to the literature, and, uh, and Google and Wikipedia said, well, it's called social proof. So we adjust. Uh, when we are new and unfamiliar situations uh, to how others act. And we uh, kind of try to mimic that, okay? So that's how we go around the world. That's because we hate to think. And instead of thinking what is appropriate here, we just look to what everybody else does. And we try to mimic that behavior. So that's one principle that's in effect. Another thing is anchoring. So we can set the bar as what is acceptable. Okay. So the anchor was set at here at, on, the, on the left side at pennies, uh, on the right side at $5 bills, and you can even go further, right? You get the point. So I started looking uh, about around the web to see are people actually using these principles. Is this in effect on the, the uh, websites I use every day? And it was. So this is me searching for beer in Copenhagen, and uh, wow to guide my decision on where to go, there's social proof in effect. So I can see that Mikkeler bar has more reviews, so more people are going there, so that's probably more, uh, that's probably more uh, popular or a better place. So we can use it not only to manipulate users, but also to guide decisions, to filter out all the noise. It doesn't have to be quantifiable. You can also use social proof in the terms of testimonials. Uh, it's more on the emotional side, but it's the exact same principle in effect. And similarly, just putting, I, I know it seems dumb and obvious, but just putting the logos on there of prominent companies, uh, prominent customers, we think, well, if they're using it, it might be good as well for me, because I know these guys are doing really well. 
And it's so simple, but it actually works. A-B test after A-B test have shown that just putting the logos on that conversion page increases conversion, in increases click-through rate. All right, so one thing is to use psychology to increase motivation, but you can actually also use it to better the usability. So we use psychology in terms of removing friction. We talk about cognitive load. So what is cognitive load? It sounds academic, at least it is. But let's see here, click. So cognitive load is the total amount of mental effort being used in our working memory. Okay, so when we are asleep, like we heard uh, before, our cognitive load or capacity goes down and we get more stressed. So if we put too much uh, info or things to, to, to have it to decide about or uh, to work uh, and think about in the user's mind, uh, then we stress them. And then chances are that they will leave your user experience too early is bigger. Okay, so if we some, in some way can reduce the cognitive load, chances are that they will make uh, all, it all the way through uh, the user experience. So, as an example, um, let's see here, click. All right, so the Obama-Biden campaign, it's in 2008, so it's, it's a while ago, but it's so documented that it's, it's really good. So they started out with the standard sign-up form or donation form that you've seen a thousand times. Everything crammed into one place. Uh, they even had an, an, no, no priority. It's all on a white background. Um, you even got the permission text in the bottom. It's, it's so much to comprehend. Uh, the end result, after, I think, 240 A-B tests, uh, let's see, can we move that? Was this on the right? So they parted uh, the experience into four separate things. And they made a visual hierarchy uh, in the buttons. So instead of just choosing in, on radio buttons, they just made it uh, highlighted with a nice uh, blue color. Uh, but that kind of affords you to click it. And instead of having a donate now or next button, it just automatically goes on to the next step. So they found out that this was really good and it worked, uh, but it wasn't in one go. It took 240 A-B tests, but they lifted the conversion rate by 49%. So this principle is called chunking, and it's, it's about reducing the cognitive load of the user. Okay? So when we group information into smaller bits, users can manage it more easily. All right, so another uh, important thing is processing fluency. So processing fluency is kind of how you speak a language or listen and learn and, and observe. It's the same thing with user experiences. So the ease with which people process information. So there are three types or three genres of, of processing fluency. One is conceptual, so you can put words in the mouth of, of users and they'll probably uh, say that the first thing if, if you ask them. We're not going to go into that, that's kind of coercion. Uh, but if you look at the last two, oh, this clicker, uh, per this perceptual and the linguistic. So can we make it clear, just like you saw in the Obama-Biden example with the buttons and all nice uh, enclosed and stuff, and, and can you have nice and simple language, and, or could you combine the two, nice visual clarity with clear language, then you've got magic. Okay, so this is the next thing. You just saw that already. Go. All right, come on. All right, so this is the front page, the sign-up page for the uh, American dating site called OKCupid. Okay it is as simple as can be. They integrated the form in the text. Here, there is a persuasion, uh, persuasive mechanism in play that's called intentional gaps. So, uh, because you're reading it, you kind, it, it kind of looks bad if it doesn't stem. Okay, so if I'm not straight, I feel inclined to change that right away. So instead of reading a headline, and okay, so what do I need to do here? Okay, then change it. It's just filling out a sentence, it's kind of doing crosswords. So this is much more easy on our processing fluency than having an ordinary form. Okay, so let's talk about seduction, the seduction. So how do you close the deal? 
And how do I click to the next slide? That is the mystery. I'm getting a new clicker after this. OK, so I'm just going to stand over here. So I'm going to throw you three, uh, show you three effective uh, ways of, of closing the deal. So I'm going to show using these different um, uh, mechanisms, persuasive mechanisms. Okay, so, so the first example is kayak.com. It's kind of like uh, Momondo in Denmark or uh, booking.com. Um, the way they force users to take action is that they use scarcity as well. So there's only three seats left at this price, OK? So that's one principle. You've already learned that. The next thing, hot jar. So this is a normal uh, front page, landing page of, of an app. It's got menus, navigation. It's got all the logos I talked about before. But once you decide to sign up, what happens? All that goes away. Because now you are in a new phase. And the main thing here is just getting you through that, uh, those two steps of signing up. So using tunneling, you can close off all detours, and you can control the path. And you can make sure that people arrive at B when they started at A. This is example is, is a donation page as well. And even though it's for uh, nonprofit and it's all good, there are several persuasive principles in play. So if you look at this box here, um, there is, uh, let's see here, there's completion. So we, want, we have a, a, a shared goal of raising uh, $25,000. We're not right there, there right uh, yet, but uh, let's, let's do it together. Um, there's another thing called anchoring, because if you're in doubt of how much should I donate, you can see the last donations there. So it gives you an indication of what is acceptable. What's the social norm here? And lastly, uh, social proof. Again, you can see that there are actual people doing it. They have actual names there. So the more specific you can be uh, in, in terms of who does this, are they li like me? Do they have a name that rings uh, like I do or something similar? Then we are more inclined to actually take action. So using persuasive design is not always uh, just getting an action uh, right away. Sometimes you can do it differently. This is uh, a, the front page of a uh, service called Stitch Fix. Um, it's kind of like the Danish service called Cloakroom. I don't know if you know that. But the service is that you fill out a form, and uh, you're sent a box of clothes. And uh, it should fit you, of course. And if it doesn't, you uh, turn the remaining items back and rate it. Say, did I like it or not? And, and the whole idea is that the more you rate and the more they know about you, uh, the better they'll be at uh, predicting your style. So that means that you don't have to shop. So what happens when you click uh, the Get Started button is that you're taken to this sign-up form. And this sign-up form is not like normal sign-up forms. Uh, at media side, you would think that they could use some persuasive design there uh, in the first place. But there is actually a reason behind this. Isn't that crazy? So why would anybody fill that out? Well, if you're a girl and you are having trust issues, uh, this is the services for girls um, only. Uh, if you have trust issues in, in terms of, will this predict uh, my style? Uh, the, will this service actually know me? Filling out a whole lot of data about yourselves provides that confidence. So that's one thing, the whole trust issue. But the next thing is the endowment effect. So once we have invested a lot of time in it, uh, I mean, that took this form. It, it took 50 minutes to fill out. Uh, once we have invested all that time, we don't want to let that go. We want to give it a chance. So the more we invest up front, the more we can get users to do stuff the more inclined they are to continue because they want to see if that investment paid off. Okay? In this case, people would actually fill out that form because that was the whole point of that service. So sometimes adding friction can actually be a bonus. All right, so that's what I had about being seduced. Let's go to the next one uh, about falling in love. 
So this is where um, you need both a user uh, perspective and a business perspective. So first, as a business, you have certain goals that you want to achieve. And instead of just saying what's good for user, what, what is good for the user, you should probably also see how do we actually stay alive as a business. It's okay. But you would define different goals. Well, that could be we want users to upload more pictures because then we actually have a service that's valuable. Uh, we want to get more page views. I don't know, it could be several different things. We want to convert readers to members, get users to tell us what they like, so forth, right? Um, get people to comment more. So those are all business goals, behavioral goals, things that we want users to do in order for our service uh, to be successful. Then on the other hand, we have user goals. User goals are completely different. User goals are uh, more emotional. Uh, it's about uh, fears, aspirations, uh, something like, uh, yeah, I want to get something others don't have. How do you actually do that? That's, that's kind of hard. Um, I just want to feel good about myself. Those goals are completely different, a whole other league. So you need to translate those into something that you can actually build. And how do you do that? Well, you look at the two, and you need to find out where they overlap. Because if you only go over the business goals, only think about yourself and your business, then this persuasion thing is not honest. Then it becomes manipulation. And it might work in the short run, but in the longer run, people will run away. They'll abandon your service. Okay? So you need to have a match between user goals and business goals. All right, so we have all those goals. We combine them together. And because the user goals are kind of weird, they won't match the business goals. So you would say that, well, find more stuff that I like. Well, in order to do that, we need to get users to tell us what they like. Otherwise, we can't give them more stuff that, that they like. And that kind of becomes the chicken and the egg problem. So how do we solve that? And that's where you start talking about primary and secondary goals. Because sometimes you need to solve a secondary goal before you solve a primary goal. Sometimes it's kind of too blocks that need to match, and you need a connecting piece in order for this uh, to start making sense. So sometimes you need to build those bridges. So I'm going to show you two different examples of how to collect such data in order to have a valuable service. So uh, I have this site called uipatterns.com, and I have documented user interfaces since 2007. Uh, so I have quite some data, and I've been watching Last.fm for a long while, and when they first started their service, uh, it looked like this in the sign-up flow. Uh, they wanted to know what kind of music I liked because, well, last of them, you don't know it, is the service that plays music you like, and the more you rate it, you can like heart a song that you uh, if, that, that that plays and you like, and it'll play more of that. But in order to just have some value to you in the beginning of of, of its life, it needs to kind of get started. So this is how they asked me to get started. Now the problem is that they just asked me. So when was the last time that people would ask me uh, what kind of music I listened to? That was in high school. And back then, it was important to say the right thing. So, so what came to mind was those exact questions that I said in high school. Well, I, I like Metallica, I like Guns N' Roses, and I like that music. But I mean, I don't listen to it that much today. Uh, but if they would start playing that music to me right now, it'd be, it would kind of be like being in my teenage room uh, at my parents' place. Okay? So that wouldn't provide a valuable service to me right now. Um, so what they did two years after, uh, they changed the sign-up flow into this. So in the new sign-up flow, uh, it was different altogether. So first of all, uh, they set the scene in a different way. Um, I'm presented to a list of pre-selected artists um, that I can start selecting. And once I do that, I, I kind of add a few people, and then it says refresh. So I started playing around, and I, I kind of wanted to do more. Um, 
Let's see here. And it came up with more artists. So what I also found is that the artists I selected before matched the ones, uh, and the, the articles, that, the new articles, uh, the new, sorry, the new uh, artists that they presented to me matched the one I had just selected. So I kind of wanted to play, uh, play it to see how good it could get. So I ended up going through nine of these pages. And it was fun. So they got a whole lot more of useful information around me, uh, 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 from me. So why does this work? Well, it had a good combination of user goals. It was fun and business goals. It was a good connecting piece. And let's see here. One uh, pattern that used was recognition or recall. So when we are to name something from memory, it's much easier to recognize things from a list than it is to recall it from memory. Okay? It reduces the cognitive load. And if you're smart about it, uh, you can use it to, to uh, create a sense of momentum that people uh, feel they're fast or feedback, just like they did here, right? So they also supplied me a way to actually search for artists. So if I wanted Metallica in there, like the Teenage Room, I could actually search for it and find it. And so what they other also did was that they said, to give you great recommendations, we need to know about your current music taste. Get started. So they actually explained to me why they want this, okay? So if I tell them about my music taste, uh, then uh, I'll get something back. So they introduced a feedback loop. And uh, because I wanted to game the system, uh, I was intrigued by the pattern recognition. Could, could I find out if, uh, if I could game it? If they had some pattern that I could discover? It was fun. The next part of seduction uh, or falling in love is, is, is kind of exposing your best parts because once you got the users to sign up and they're in there, uh, they might just see your dashboard but don't know what to do or how to get started. So, so how do you actually do that? So, what you want to do is kind of show people what to do, and once they do it, then reinforce the behavior. So I'm going to show you two different ways of reinforcing behavior. So this is the dashboard of a couple of years ago from URPatterns.com on Facebook. And what they've done is that, well, yeah, what they did was they, they created a scoreboard for me so I could add my competitors. And even though at that point uh, I didn't have that many followers, I could see that since last week, I did the most progress. I was a rising star. So it kept up my motivation. So they provided me uh, with a way of, of finding out my status to assess where I am and, and how much speed and momentum I have uh, re uh, relative to, to my competitors. It was also kind of an achievement keeping that big uh, growth rate and finally beating some of them. A different take uh, on, on reinforcing behavior uh, is from nationalgeographic.com. Uh, they have this, uh, this section called Your Shot. It's a photography uh, competition. Now, if you read nationalgeographic.com, uh, you would know that uh, a big aspiration of a lot of the readers are actually getting your photo in, uh, in the magazine. So a lot of the readers are photographers themselves. So your shot, uh, the your shot section provides readers to kind of uh, get uh, to, be, to to play around being a photographer themselves. So you get assignments, you get stories. Uh, great photographers comment on your photos, and you can win prizes and just send out in the field. So there's a whole bunch of storytelling. You can be part of the story. There's an appropriate challenge because you can come in as a beginner and you can get constructive feedback on how to get started and how to get better. And once you're better, um, you can give cr uh, criticism and feedback to others, but you can also win prizes. So when you're just a beginner, you're just looking for feedback from others. When you are intermediate and expert, you hope to win uh, some of these assignments. Uh, 
And of course, your reputation rises along the way. And finally, well, there's this uh, sort of reciprocation. So when we are given something, we, f we feel that we ought to give something in return. So we, when we get feedback uh, to pictures or what, whatever we upload, we feel that we should be nice to the other ones, just like others had been nice to us. So also, falling in love, sometimes you just need to show people what to do. So when you just start uh, with LinkedIn, uh, they have several examples there. So remember that uh, form from OKCupid? Well, they do the same thing. They have intentional gaps. Uh, that uh, Building a form in, in, in fluent language that you can't help but fill. They have sequenced the whole process into, uh, into manageable steps. And finally, uh, a way pride your feeling that once you're done, you have actually completed something. So, if I'm down at four, then I kind of want to finish the fifth step because I'm so close. So if you want to guide and provide good guidance, you kind of want to support practice. So you want to, be, uh, to make uh, it possible to actually make mistakes. You want to facilitate exploration. So how do you do that? Well, you show people around. You say, well, you didn't do this. This would be a good time. Um, you should kind of provide achievable goals, so uh, you're not throwing a beginner into an expert C. So provide a beginner level, just like a video game, right? Um, and remember to provide prompt feedback when they make mistakes. Now, there's also some things you need to avoid. So avoid stating the obvious. Fill out this field. Okay, it's a field. I know I need to fill it out. Don't get in the way, like modals. Don't use them unless there's a really good uh, reason to do it. Same with notifications. So avoid repeating yourself, of course, and always allow people to escape whatever path you had uh, designed for them. So tunneling is good, of course, but if they feel trapped and they feel, feel that it's too long, well, allow them to escape and come back later to resume the journey. Okay, so that's falling in love. Let's talk about staying in love. So there are different kinds of motivation. Uh, one is tangent motivation. And people just getting into the whole gamification field, uh, just throw dashboards and badges all over, they're using tangent motivation. Then there's extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation, is, it's a tad better. It's related to the action you do, and it kind of makes sense in, in a loop. Um, but ultimately, you want to aim for the intrinsic motivation. That is when you have a concept that makes so much sense in itself that it is by itself motivating, that the work you do, uh, the process itself is motivating. So if you start with tangent motivation, this thing about filling out your LinkedIn profile, that's tangent, and it'll work just to get you started. I'll work some of the way. Um, I mean, I made it all the way to 65%, but I got bored because this path was too long. But if it wasn't there, I would probably just have had 25% complete. This is a carpet store uh, close to where I live. I've been living there for 10 years. Uh, it had looked, has looked the same for 10 years. Right, so that probably worked the first year or the first month. But by me biking by it day after day for 10 years, I kind of start mistrusting it, okay? So this is, of course, scarcity, uh, but it's totally unrelated. It's, it's unrealistic. Uh, I, they've just lost me. Same thing. Now, I, I walked into the, um, uh, to the session here about uh, sleep, and I, uh, I heard uh, the thing about, um, about uh, voting, right? And you need to rate this. It's really important. It is. Um, and you can win something. And I actually think that was fun. So what, what they did there was tangent motivation. It's completely unrelated to the, uh, to the uh, behavioral goal they want you to do. Okay, so you get a prize, a USB stick. I mean, it's, it's a nice prize, but what does it have to do with rating? So, of course, the pattern here is rewards. First thing that could have been better is to make it variable. 
So instead of saying we have a draw at the end of the day, because what happens when the draw is there? Right after the activity drops. Okay. So when well, when is the next one going to be? Well, oh, I don't want to do it. Okay. So. One thing you can do, th this kind of reward schedule is called a fixed reward. That's because we know when the reward is coming. Facebook uses something else. It's called variable rewards, where timing is randomized. It's randomized because you don't know when your friends are sending you a message or when you will get a no notification. And that kind of gets you in there all the time, wanting to check, are there something for me right now? You could make it even better by... Uh, Connecting it to the experience. Get the slides from that talk if you rate it. That would problem, just a tip, go to. Nice conference, though. All right, so extrinsic motivation. Uh, that's kind of what you see when you see scoreboards. The scoreboards are nice. Um, it gives you something to strive for. So there's competition. Uh, there are achievements, of course, because you can be number one. So what's interesting about this uh, particular screenshot is that uh, they actually started out with just one high score. And uh, the problem with high scores is that uh, it's, it's really motivating for, let's say, if you have a top 10, it's motivating for the top 20. But if you have 3,000 users, it's kind of demotivating for all the rest because it's so hard to get on top. So that, that's why they actually made six different high scores. Okay, but they have, if they have 3,000 users, um, you need a lot of high scores keep, to keep them all motivated. Uh, Stack Overflow uses the same thing. Um, they have uh, compared, uh, combined it a little bit better with the more intrinsic motivation, but it is still a badge you can get. Uh, you can become a different kind of type. You can get a label. You can get a status. So, so it makes sense in that way. But it's, they dole out achievements. But it's a nice segue into what it's really about, intrinsic motivation. And intrinsic motivation is when an activity is in itself motivating. So, let's see here. Intrinsic motivation is about the experience over time. So, it's about learning. So, learning challenges. How can we accommodate beginners as well as experts? How can we make something that is worthwhile when you just sign up and when you're an expert? So it's the experience over time. It's kind of like a video game where you go from easy to medium to hard and expert. So think about what can you do in your interface, in your experience, to accommodate both for easy, easy medium, hard, and expert. Uh, it's called, a uh, solution to this is, is doing appropriate challenges. So this uh, Philosopher uh, called uh, Michali Csikszentmihalyi uh, has explains the, the flow channel where if you learn something, after a while it, you're kind of bored because your skill level rises. So you need something that is harder to do. The problem is if you give a challenge that is so hard that then uh, or too hard, then people will stress, they'll feel anxiety, and they'll probably leave. Uh, your site because it's, it's too stressful. They can't handle it in the co cognitive load. So you kind of want to force people through this flow channel, a roller coaster ride going back and forth. Okay? So think about how you can adjust your journey over time. Now you saw the high score from Facebook that I showed you before. Um, I also have this really bad band. I'm going to practice with them tonight. We haven't reached 100 likes on Facebook yet, um, but when we just created our Facebook page, uh, they provided me with a nice way to actually re reach that milestone of 100 likes. So Facebook actually accommodated for giving me appropriate challenges. They knew that I was a novice. A high score would be too much. So, and it's Facebook, so of course they could give me a uh, sneak way into it and giving me powers, and I could pay for actually reaching that goal faster. So they found a way where business goals and user goals would match. And if you don't match, it's a one-night stand. All right, so we've got intrinsic motivation. So extrinsic motivation is typically points, levels, scoreboards, badges, achievements, assignments, where intrinsic motivation 
are more emotional things like reputation, who am I, uh, what do others do, um, curiosity, surprise, uh, getting feedback on my work. Uh, it's about mastery, getting better. So intrinsic motivation is the hardest. The, the good thing about extrinsic motivation is that it's the easiest to administer. But that's also the problem because uh, in turn, uh, people just tend to do a lot more extrinsic motivation. We can just put those points and levels and scoreboards on there, and we've got a motivating interface. Um, and that might work for a short time, but if you want to have users on the long run, you need to go for intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation, of course, lies within the user, so you can't really do anything about that motivation. But what you can do is amplify it. So you can facilitate it. And you can do that by persuasive design. So that is the truest form of persuasive design, the long-lasting form, not, not this manipulation or coercion. So what, one thing you can do is to constrain the experience. We saw that with the toddling paddle pattern. So you can limit possible behaviors and exclude uh, anything that you don't want to happen. So that is what Hardjar did when they clicked the uh, sign up now button. They did tunneling, right? So that is tunneling, that is uh, yeah, constraining it. But you can also, of course, facilitate it. So then you need to find out what the user actually wants. And that's why it's so important to have those user goals and those business goals, uh, business goals because if you don't take your starting point in the user goals, uh, you won't reach intrinsic motivation. Then it's, it's only going to be a tangent, you're going to be that, that carpet salesman. Uh, and you <laughs> It might work now, but not in the long run. All right, so persuasive design can be used to seduce users to sign up. So that's being seduced. It can be used to uh, get users to start using it. So that's about falling in love. But you can only facilitate intrinsic motivation for real, engaged, ongoing use. And that's about staying in love. So now you have the power you know a bunch of persuasive mechanisms that you can start using today. Now, you can use it for the worse, but I urge you to use it for the better. Go for the intrinsic mo motivation, go for the long run, because you don't want to stay on this coercion side. You want to go for the persuasion side, where the coercion is about manipulating users and facilitation is about persuasion. So there is this persuasive continuum that you need to decide where you are on. So the question I'm going to leave you with today is what kind of world do you want to build? And I ask of you to use persuasive design in the correct way to make the world a better place. Thank you. <laughs>